I'm a bit humbled to have this opportunity to speak to you today. I appreciate the invitation to speak here to the entire conference. Uh, as I look at all the, the people who represent the ID movement that are here, uh, I, I think of so many other people that deserve this opportunity and not me. And hopefully when I'm done, you won't agree with me. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be talking about something called biological convergence. And in my opinion, this represents one of the most significant challenges to the theory of evolution. And I think this is also a very powerful, powerful marker for intelligent design and also an opportunity for the ID research program to make important uh, advances to drive uh, insight and understanding and to, and to guide future scientific work. And um, before I get started and, and discuss biological convergence, I want to do uh, one housekeeping item, and that's simply to define what I mean by biological evolution. Because this term evolution, uh, in, a, in a biological sense, is ambiguous. And I'm not talking about variation within a species, which is commonly referred to as microevolution. I'm not talking about even speciation. What I'm talking about is evolution as a creative force, where natural processes alone create, if you will. And I'm, I'm looking at evolution in the sense that this is the mechanism that explains life's diversity as we see it today, as we see it throughout Earth's history, where life originates from one or a few original forms, as Charles Darwin would have phrased it. And I also want to uh, talk about this idea of convergence in the larger context of the evolution ID debate. And so I'm going to do a little bit of, of this introduction, if you will, to try to set the stage so you can really appreciate why I think convergence is so problematic. And <clears throat> uh, the first point that I want to make is that oftentimes in this ID evolution debate, you'll see evolutionists make this statement. Evolution is a fact, and the theory is how did it occur? Evolution is a fact, and the theory is how did it occur. I'm sure almost all of you have heard this phrase. And what evolutionists are doing when they make this statement is they're arguing that evolution is both fact and theory. The fact is that it occurred. The theory, they argue, is the mechanism by which it occurred and the pathway in which evolution unfurled through life's history. And so evolution is considered both fact and theory. Now, I, I must say, to be quite frank, as a scientist, I find this an extremely bizarre statement to make. And I say this with all due respect. Uh, because in, in science, all ideas are provisional. And that evolution occurred is, assen is essentially an explanation. It's an idea. It's a theory. It's a hypothesis as to how do you account for life's diversity as we see it today. How do you account for this rich history of life that we see on the earth for the last 3.8 billion years. That evolution occurred is just as much a provisional idea as the mechanism by which evolution allegedly uh, took place or the pathway in which evolution unfurls. And so uh, in science, if we're doing good science, even well-established ideas, even if you think that evolution occurred is, is so well-established that you can consider it a fact, it still needs to be subjected to the rigors of testing as new discoveries and new observations are made. And I think the best example where this is, where this is happening is in the area of astrophysics. astrophysics. Uh, astrophysicists are to be applauded because even though, as you heard Dr. Ross say, general relativity is one of the best confirmed principles in all of physics, 15 places after the decimal point in some systems, uh, th it's still being subjected to testing. Uh, Hugh was telling me that this satellite that was just launched a few days ago cost $750 million. So even though general relativity is confirmed to 14, 15 places after the decimal point, we feel, the scientific community feels, that it's worth an investment of $750 million to do one more test just to make sure general relativity is true. That's science. That's good science. That's, and, 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 and this is the same thing that should be done in, in the biological realm. Well, the question is why? Why is that not happening? And I think you all know the answer to this if you've been around the ID movement at all. 
And, and this is, is, you know, based on foundational work that Phil Johnson has done and that others who have followed him have, have, have uh, demonstrated as well. And the reason why evolution is declared to be a fact or that it occurred is declared to be a fact is because of philosophy. It's because of the philosophy of naturalism or methodological naturalism where no appeal to a designer, no appeal to a possible supernatural natural explanation is allowed within the domains of science. This is not a demand based on the nature of the scientific process. This is a philosophy that's imposed upon scientific investigation. Now, <clears throat> I would argue that, for example, uh, when you look at evidence that oftentimes is cited for evolution as a fact, you can very easily look at that evidence uh, within a design framework. For example, homology. Homology is one of those pieces of evidence that oftentimes is, is used as evidence that evolution must be a fact. And homology refers to th th this phenomena in which organisms that, will, that are related to one another or that group together with one another actually more appropriately have uh, biological structures that are superficially different, that are functionally different, but fundamentally their structure is the same. And evolutionists say, well, when you see this type of homology, it means that these organisms must have descended, must have evolved from a common ancestor. Well, the reason why you arrive at that conclusion is because you've already determined that intelligent design can't be a viable option. And so, therefore, the only way to explain it is that evolution is a fact. You've backed yourself into the corner, so to speak, and now that evolution is demanded not by the evidence but by the philosophy that you're using. You could easily explain this as a single designer using the same design uh, to create different organisms, if you will, where the common ancestor is rep replaced with an archetype that exists in that mind of the intelligent designer. And so my question today is, and this sets the context in essence for my entire talk, is can we really declare biological evolution to be a fact? Can we declare that evolution occurred to be a fact? And the way in which I'm going to approach this is through this very simple set of criteria, simple but powerful. And this is actually something that uh, Hugh Ross developed many years ago, and when I saw this, this was extremely helpful to me as I was sorting through this whole issue of whether or not evolution actually occurred. And as Dr. Ross says, you know, and I agree fully, that if any type of transformation occurs in nature, whether it's in the biological realm, the cosmic realm, the geological realm, if that transformation occurs through natural processes alone, you need to be able to identify a mechanism that can generate that type of change. That mechanism needs to operate in the time available to it, under the conditions available to it, and you need to see, have, have some type of time-based verification, whether you directly observe that process or that there's some proxy that allows you to observe that process through time. For example, the fossil record would be an example where you could, in, in principle, observe evolutionary transformations taking place. And what I'm going to do today is focus on the mechanistic aspect of this, of this criteria. And uh, if we're going to do that, we need to very quickly review uh, the mechanism for uh, biological evolution. And I'm sure that what I'm saying here isn't necessarily new to many of you, but this is just simply to put us all on the same footing. And evolution's mechanism is really no different today than it was when Darwin offered the origin of species. It basically argues that they're within a population of individuals, of, uh, in, individuals in a population that represents a species, have, um, are, are unique. The individuals are unique. There's variation within that population. Some of that variation is environmentally induced. Some is due to lifestyle effects. But other variation is essentially genetic in nature and can be inherited and passed on to the next generation, and all populations are subjected to what are called the forces of natural selection. And these forces of natural selection mean that certain traits and trait combinations are going to make that particular individual more or less likely to survive. If that individual is more likely to survive uh, and, and has increased reproductive success because of that, those traits will be passed on to the next generation, and over time, trait frequencies will vary in response to changes in, in the selective environment. Now, if this is all there is to it, then there's really nothing, there really is no biological evolution as such. It's simply variation within a species, but evolutionists argue that mutations or changes in the genetic material take place. And this is a, these are essentially random events that alter the genetic material, 
and these uh, mutations are transmittable to the next generation. And, the argu- and, and there's debate as to whether these are uh, gradual stepwise changes that lead to new structures or whether they're single changes that have radical effects. Uh, that's all debated, but the point is that chance mutational events create in, in a sense, new information that's transmitted to the next generation. And if that creates a trait that's useful, then that trait can take hold in the population. Also part of evolution's mechanism is isolation, that part of that population can fragment into a subpopulation, and as a result of isolation, whether it's geographical or ecological or behavioral or sexual, um, you can get... uh, different components of that population evolving, if you will, in separate directions because those different components, once isolated, are experiencing different mutations and different forces of natural selection. But the whole point is that chance is the ultimate governor of the evolutionary process. At its very essence, chance defines the evolutionary process. And it's not strictly, in my opinion, just on the mutational end just on the alteration of the genetic material, I would even argue that the selective filter uh, of natural selection is also a chance component, also consists of chance components as well. Now, if this is the case, or or, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould, developed this concept, or at least articulated this concept called historical contingency to define the essence of the evolutionary process. And Gould's point is that it's not just simply chance that dominates evolution, but it's a sequence of chance events. It's a historical sequence of chance events. Evolution is historically contingent, and this is the implications of this. Uh, In essence, that evolution can't repeat. Uh, Gould's metaphor is that if you rewind the tape of life and replay it again, the outcome is going to be different every time. And the reason for this is because no finale, as Gould says, can be specified at the start. None would ever occur a second time in the same way because any pathway proceeds through thousands of improbable stages. Alter any early event ever so slightly and without apparent importance at the time, an evolution cascades into radically different channels. Now, Gould's argument was essentially a qualitative argument. This was a quote that I took out of a book called Wonderful Life. But in the end, at the end of 2002 in the journal Nature, a paper was published where a team did computer simulation studies of the macroevolutionary process and determined that macroevolution is essentially a historically contingent process. That every time they ran their simulation, they could show that the trajectory that evolution took was different every time. It was unpredictable. It was historically contingent. It was non-repeatable. And so this really brings us to the way in which we can test evolution. It's It's a test of historical contingency. When we look at the living realm today, is it characterized as a contingent realm? Uh, Do we see any evidence in which we would interpret it as evolution having repeated itself when we look at things from an evolutionary perspective? And so what I'm doing here, in essence, is I'm testing the mechanism for evolution, but I'm not doing this directly, but I'm doing it indirectly. If evolution's mechanism is true, if historical contingency, which defines evolution's mechanism, is ultimately responsible for the living realm today, then we should see a certain pattern. We predict a certain pattern, non-repeatability. However, if we see another pattern, that calls into question the validity of of evolution. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, And and this is where the concept of biological convergence becomes so important. Now, we are poised at a time in which the techniques are available within the evolutionary biology community to really put this idea to the test in a comprehensive way. And in order to understand why that's the case, I need to very briefly introduce you to the concepts of something called phylogenetics. And again, many of you are probably familiar with this, but this area of evolutionary biology is the process by which evolutionary biologists attempt to define the pathways of evolution. And and the techniques are actually fairly complex techniques. Tremendous amount of debate in the literature about the methodologies involved in phylogenetics, but the concept is relatively simple. Basically, if you take a group of organisms, you you can group them into groups. 
you can classify them or cluster them into groups. And then smaller groups can be grouped into larger groups, and those larger groups in turn can be grouped into even larger groups. This is called a nested hierarchy. And then once this is done, evolutionists, in essence, interpret this in the form of an evolutionary tree, where they say that group within grouping within grouping is explicable through essentially descent with modification from a common ancestor, where the groups that are in existence today represent the tips of the evolutionary tree, and those groups that cluster together within a larger group must have shared a common ancestor, and that's represented as a node in the evolutionary tree. And you can repeat that process and work your way back to uh, uh, the most recent common ancestor with respect to the particular system you're at, er, looking at. Well, the way in which evolutionists traditionally have built these evolutionary trees is using something called morphological phylo phylogenetics. And this is essentially using anatomical features or physiological features to build evolutionary trees, looking for similarities and differences among the organisms, and then, again, interpreting it within an evolutionary context. Well, in recent years, another approach has emerged to the forefront arguably so, within evolutionary biology. And this is the use of DNA sequences to build evolutionary trees. And this is called molecular phylogenetics. And the idea here is that organisms that have similar DNA sequences, according to the evolutionary mindset, must have shared a common ancestor much more recently than organisms that have a large difference in their genetic makeup. And what's going on now is that evolutionary biologists are essentially taking morphological phylogenies and imposing the molecular phylogenies on top of them. Or they're taking molecular phylogenies and they're mapping morphological features onto them. And this allows us to, to probe as to whether or not evolution can repeat itself. This is the way in which we can put this idea to the test. And what do you discover? Well, you discover, for example, a phenomena known as repeated evolution. I've seen this referred to as repeated evolution in the literature, and this is a growing phenomena, or the phenomena is becoming increasingly recognized within the evolutionary biology community. And what I mean by repeated evolution is it looks as if species that, should have had, that are morphologically indistinguishable had independent evolutionary origins. Now, the evolutionary term is that instead of a particular species being monophyletic, it's either diphyletic or polyphyletic. What did I just say there? It's, it's mono, mono means single. So something, a species that's monophyletic is a species that had a single evolutionary origin. And, and presumably, uh, individuals that are morphologically identical or indistinguishable should belong to the same species and should have a single evolutionary origin because evolution doesn't repeat. Well, what's being recognized is that species that were thought to be monophyletic, based on morphology, turn out to be diphyletic, di meaning two, having two separate origins, or polyphyletic, meaning having many separate origins. Independent evolutionary events that generate identical organisms. And this is called repeated evolution. And here is just a few examples that I've stumbled across. This is not based on an exhaustive search of the literature. These are just a few examples I've stumbled across uh, examples of repeated evolution that have just recently been discovered within the last couple of years, and the list goes on. There's even recognition that some species that are found in the fossil record actually have di or polyphyletic origins based on ancient DNA analysis. So that's really quite intriguing, quite, uh, quite uh, exciting, cutting-edge research. But the whole point is that we're seeing uh, numerous examples of repeated evolution. And I just kind of want to walk through one example so you get the full thrust of what I'm saying when I'm talking about repeated evolution. And I decided to talk about the Ronid frogs uh, after my namesake. My father was a Rana from India, and so I'm going to be talking about Ronid frogs from India and Madagascar. Um, now, in India and Madagascar, there's a number of frog species, as you might imagine, and some of those frogs are, are species are called tree frogs, and some are called burrowing frogs. And there are tree frog species in India and Madagascar that are considered at one time to be the same species. They're morphologically indistinguishable, and in fact, their developmental pathways are indistinguishable. Likewise, there are burrowing frog species that are identical in India and Madagascar. And the traditional evolutionary explanation for this was that these tree frogs and these burrowing frog species evolved one time when India and Madagascar were part of Africa. And then plate tectonics drove the separation of those land masses, and as a result of that, those different species became geographically separated from one another. 
Interestingly enough, when mitochondrial DNA analysis is done on these frog species, it turns out that the tree frog species in India and in Madagascar have no genetic connection to one another. Likewise, the same is true with the burrowing frogs. And this means that these species that are morphologically indistinguishable, that are developmentally in indistinguishable, had to have independent evolutionary origins. And again, these, these, this is not an oddity in nature. This is being recognized as an emerging uh, characteristic within the living realm. So this is called repeated evolution. I'm going to skip that example. Now to, to the... The topic at hand, convergence. Uh, convergence is a related idea and a related problem to the problem that we just discussed about repeated evolution. And to understand convergence, you need to understand a little bit about the history of the idea and where this term comes from. Now, in the I think in the in the 1830s, 1840s, Sir Richard Owen, a well-known uh, anatomist of his time developed two concepts called homology and analogy. And we've already talked a little bit about homology. Excuse me. And homology, in, in, according to Sir Richard Owens, simply referred to organisms that had different, uh, superficially different biological structures, but the, the design of those structures was fundamentally the same. And he called those structures homologous structures. Evolutionists have come along and have said, we can explain homology as descent with modification from a common ancestor. Sir Richard Owen also noted that there are some organisms that don't group together, that have, organ, that have structures, biological structures, that are very similar to one another, that have a similar function, but they fundamentally are different structures, though they, they, they structurally are the same and functionally are the same. He called these analogous structures, and the way in which evolutionary biologists explain analogous structures is to argue that evolution converged on a common solution, that the forces of natural selection drove the evolutionary process down similar channels to arrive at comparable solutions to the same problems. And, and the classic examples of convergence are things like a bird's wing and a bat's wing. Well, that isn't that troubling within the evolutionary framework because though those structures are similar, they're not identical structures. But again, what's being recognized now are examples of convergence that uh, no longer involve similar structures, they involve structures that are essentially identical. And again, from a morphological standpoint, you would argue that these structures should have originated a single time. Uh, also, we're seeing examples of convergence that, in my opinion, are becoming way too frequent. Uh, because you, if you would expect convergence to occur rarely, if at all, given the historically contingent nature of the evolutionary process, and we also are seeing examples of convergence originating under conditions in which the forces of natural selection are quite different. And what I want to do is just give a few examples so you can begin to appreciate what I'm talking about. But before I do that, I just want to, again, run through a laundry list of some recently recognized examples of convergence. These are the types of systems that we're talking about that now have independent, multiple evolutionary origins, if you're looking at things from an evolutionary framework. And I'm just going to kind of step through this list. And what I want to do is my example is talk about bat origins, um, because this is, a, I think, one of, the most re one of the more remarkable instances of convergence, and we actually three, see three instances of convergence with respect to the origin of bats. Now, bats are mammals, and about, there's over a thousand species of bats, so one-fourth of all mammal species are bats, believe it or not. And bats belong to an order called Chiroptera. And, and uh, so if you, if you like to comic books, it's not Batman, it's Chiroptera Man. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, there are two groupings of bats, microbats or microchiroptera and megachiroptera, two suborders. I'm going to call them microbats and megabats. And microbats are the bats that echolocate, and everybody knows what echolocation is. It's this incredibly complex physiological sensory system. And the echolocation is essentially the tool that bats use to detect their prey, which are insects. Bats are insectivores. On the other hand, we have megabats, which are frugophores. They eat fruit, and, and their defining characteristic is their remarkable degree of visual acuity. Uh, these bats actually have a visual system that is very similar, if not indistinguishable, from the visual system of primates. So it's a, a very remarkable system. Now, traditionally, bats have been grouped within a superorder 
called Archonta that includes primates, Scandentia, which are tree shrews, and Dermoptera, which are flying lemurs. And the reason why these four orders were grouped together is because bats have a, a shared visual system uh, with uh, at least megabats with primates. The flight apparatus of bats is indistinguishable from that of flying lemurs. And so the argument is that these four orders essentially must have shared a common ancestor, and so therefore they're grouped within a superorder. And the reason for that is based on the morphological features that they share. Well, when DNA analysis has been applied to bat origins, what turns out to be the, the net result of this is that echolocation must have evolved two times independently in both microbats and megabats. And the basis for this is that there's a, a, a superfamily of bats known as Rhinolophophidia that have traditionally been uh, classified as, as microbats because they echolocate. Well, it turns out that based on their genetic makeup, they properly are classified as megabats, and this means that echolocation must have originated independently both in megabats and in microbats. Also, uh, bats really don't belong to the superorder Archonta. They actually belong to an order called Ferra ungulata, which includes carnivores and ungulates. What this means is that the flight apparatus in bats and flying lemurs must have had an independent evolutionary origin, and the visual system in primates and bats likewise must have had an independent evolutionary origin. And I think this is obviously deeply troubling. And how is it that evolutionary biologists are responding to these types of discoveries? They're, they're responding by recognizing that this is problematic. This is a quote that I lifted from the abstract of a paper published in 2002 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This researcher was looking at the origin of arthropod compound eyes and arrived at the conclusion that uh, was quite remarkable, namely that arthropod compound eyes had independent evolutionary origins. And this is what he says. Arthropod compound eye evolution has remained controversial because one of two seemingly very unlikely evolutionary histories must be true. Either compound eyes with detailed similarities evolved multiple times in different arthropod groups, or compound eyes have been lost in a seemingly inordinate number of arthropod lineages. Either way you interpret the results, it makes no sense, in essence, within the evolutionary framework. Okay, I'm going to skip this example just because of time uh, and talk about another example of convergence that I think is deeply troubling as well. And this is convergence that occurs in different environments. And the example I'm going to use is convergence in an aquatic and a terrestrial environment. Turns out that the chameleon and the sand lance visual system is an identical system that must have emerged independently multiple times. Now, um, everybody is familiar with the, a chameleon, right? Remember those old beer commercials with the chameleons? And, and those, those chameleons weren't very nice. I mean, they are, they're always upset about the frogs getting all the, the, the attention. But anyway, I'm, I just love beer commercials. I don't drink beer, but I love beer commercials. So anyway... Whoever's drinking beer and buying it, keep doing it so I can watch beer commercials. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the, the chameleon visual system is, is quite interesting. I mean, the eyes of the chameleon, everybody's probably familiar with this. They move kind of independently of one another like this. Well, what the chameleon does is he holds one eye constant or, or motionless and the other eye moves around. And interestingly enough, the chameleon doesn't focus using the lens of the eye, but rather the cornea. And there's an entire set of muscles that actually allow the cornea to change its shape in order to, to, to focus the image on the back of the retina. And the way in which the chameleon determines depth is by rastering the eye back and forth very rapidly, and that displaces the image on the, on the back of the, the retina, and the degree of displacement gives the chameleon information about how far away something is. And when, when a fly or something flies by a chameleon, the, the, the tongue that, that goes out and grabs the, or you know, sticks to the fly or whatever, the insect, uh, emanates from the mouth at a, a very precise angle of trajectory. Well, it turns out that the sand lance, which, lance, which is a bottom-dwelling fish, has an identical visual system. And even the attack trajectory is the same uh, with respect to the sand lance and the chameleon. This is troubling because... The, one is a, the chameleon is a terrestrial organism. It lives on the land. 
The sand lance is a fish. It's an aquatic organism. You can't say that they ha they're subjected in their life histories to the same forces of natural selection. It's a very different environment, yet you see identical systems that are emerging uh, under these very different environments. And this is what the, the, the scientists who discovered this convergence said. When faced with a beautifully coordinated optical system such as this, it's a challenge to provide an explanation for the convergence of so many different finely tuned mechanisms. Again, this makes no sense within the evolutionary framework. Now, there's another type of convergence that, that I think is, is quite remarkable as well, and this is molecular convergence. This is convergence that is, that is taking place at the cellular, at, actually at the biochemical level inside the cell. This is not organismal convergence, but this is molecular convergence where the biomolecules seem to have independent evolutionary origins. And there's four, no, sorry, five different types of molecular convergence. One is called functional convergence, where biomolecules that have independent origins have identical functions in the cell. One is called mechanistic convergence, where the, the biomolecules have independent origins, but their chemical mechanism of operation is the same. The third is structural convergence, where the three-dimensional structure, for example, typically it's proteins, uh, though they have independent origins, are identical three-dimensional structures. Oftentimes you see, all, you see three or four levels of convergence operating simultaneously, where it's both functional and mechanistic, or structural, mechanistic, and functional. There's even examples of sequence convergence where the amino acids or the genes have independent origins, but they're vast regions that have identical sequences. And the final example is something called systemic convergence, where entire biochemical systems seem to have independent multiple origins. And this, again, is an, a laundry list of, of examples of molecular convergence that I've stumbled across in the literature uh, this is not an exhaustive search, this is just some examples. Many of them uh, I've, I've added to this list just in the last uh, few months. The whole point is that this is not an oddity of nature, but this is being recognized increasingly as a defining feature of the, of the biochemical realm. And here's two examples of systems that have emerged independently. And the one I want to talk about is DNA replication. Based on the, 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 the genetic sequences of the, of the genes that code for the proteins involved in DNA replication, it turns out that DNA replication must have originated independently from an evolutionary perspective in eubacteria and archaeobacteria. And these are two fundamental, different, fundamentally different domains of life. And it looks as if, based on, again, the genetic makeup of the, of the genes that code for the, the proteins, that these had independent evolutionary origins, yet the, the mechanism and the process of DNA replication and these two domains of life is identical. Now, if anybody out here is a biochemist, you immediately know how amazing this conclusion is. Okay, but I'm sure there are people out here who are not biochemists, so that for you to appreciate what I'm talking about, I'm going to do a quick overview of DNA replication, so you can appreciate just the magnitude of that conclusion. Here's a cartoon of the structure of the DNA molecule. And DNA is a chain-like molecule, so there's two chains that are aligned in a parallel fashion. The chains are formed by linking together four different subunits called nucleotides. They're abbreviated as A, G, C, and T. They're known as genetic letters as well. And um, uh, the, from the side group of the, of the, the molecular chains, uh, or sorry, the side groups that extend from the molecular chains interact, and it looks like the rungs of a ladder, and if you twist that ladder, you get the well-known DNA double helix. Well. The, the, the sequences of nucleotides in the DNA molecule contain the information needed to make proteins that carry out the cell's function and the cell structure. Now, the chains, in, in, in truth, are not really allied in a parallel fashion. They actually are aligned in what's called an anti-parallel fashion, where, there's a, uh, where the top of one chain is aligned parallel to the bottom of the other chain. The, the nucleotides that are linked together to form DNA molecules are linked together in a head-to-tail fashion. That means that there's a po polarity or a directionality to each of the, the DNA chains, and so the chains are oriented in opposite directions, bottom to top, top to bottom, if you will. That's why one of the, on one of the uh, chains, the letters are oriented upside down. That's not a typo, but that's intentional to, to communicate the, the anti-parallel nature of the DNA chains. And this is very important when it gets to DNA replication. Also, 
the, the nucleotide sequences of one strand are complementary to the sequences of the other strand. And, and what, what I'm saying is that uh, on one strand, A's always pair with T's and G's always pair with C's. And because of that, if you know the sequence of one strand, you know the sequence of the other strand because of that, the, the Watson-Crick base pairing rules, because of that complementary nature. And this is an important feature as well when it comes to the process of DNA replication. Now, the way in which DNA replicates is by a process known as template-directed semi-conservative replication. Now, when biochemists were trying to understand how DNA replicated, this was not the only possible mechanism that was on the table. There were other alternative mechanisms that were being explored. So the point is that there's no law of nature that demands DNA replication occur in this way. Uh, there are other possible ways. And so what we're saying is that when DNA replication emerges, it emerges so that we have an identical mechanism, if you will, in archaeobacteria and eubacteria, namely this semi-conservative replication. Uh, and what that simply means is that it conceptually, when a DNA molecule replicates, the two strands separate, and because the sequences are complementary, one strand, each of the strands can serve as a template to assemble a second strand. And so the, the, we have a parent molecule. The parent molecule separates into two parent strands. The parent strands direct the, the, the formation of the daughter strands with a complementary DNA sequence. And the net result is that you have two daughter DNA molecules. One of the, each of the daughters has a strand from the original parent and a newly made strand. That's why it's called semi-conservative replication. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. There are other possible mechanisms for DNA replication. Now, this is where the fun really begins. Uh, DNA replication is, is a bi-directional process. When replication occurs, the cell can't just start replication any old, any old place it wants to on the DNA molecule. There are very precise points of initiation for the replication process. These are called DNA replication points. And then there's a machinery cell uh, complex of proteins that recognizes the initiation sites. And then when that, that site is recognized, there's something that, that forms that's called the replication bubble, where the DNA strand doesn't completely unwind and separate, but rather it only unwinds and separates in a local environment, and that's called the replication bubble. And <clears throat> uh, within that bubble, uh, replication occurs in both directions. It's called bidirectional, and the point where the, the strands start to unwind is called the replication fork. Now, remember I said that the two chains are oriented top to bottom and bottom to top. That's very important in DNA replication because the cell's machinery that replicates DNA can only do it from a top to bottom fashion, from what's called the five prime to three prime end. It can only do it in one direction. It can't do it in both directions. So when you open up at one replication fork, in one case, the strand is in the right orientation, and the cell's machinery can start right away and begin to replicate the DNA molecule. This is called the leading strand, and that's called continuous replication. On the other strand, however, because this chain is oriented in the wrong way, the, the cell has to wait until enough of the DNA molecule has been separated for a significant portion to be exposed so that the, the machinery can then replicate the DNA, but it replicates it backwards away from the replication fork. And then and it, and it can only do a short segment, then it has to wait for more of the, the double helix to unwind, then it can do another segment, then it has to wait for more to unwind, then it does another segment. And each time you're generating fragments, called Okasaki fragments, if you're interested. And, uh, uh, but this is, these, this is called discontinuous replication because it's fragment by fragment by fragment, and it's slower on that strand than it is on the other strand, so it's called the lagging strand. And, and, then, and, then, and at the replication fork, uh, one of the strands at the replication fork is the leading strand, the other is the lagging strand. At the other replication fork, the, the, the strands uh, uh, change so that the, the strand that's the lagging strand at one fork is the leading strand at the other fork, and that the leading strand at one fork is the lagging strand at the other fork. Okay? And again, there's no law that says DNA replication has to occur this way. Okay? Uh, th th it could occur in a number of different ways, but the fact is that this is the same mechanism that you see in archaeobacteria and eubacteria. Okay, now let's put proteins into this. Uh, <clears throat> in, in, in inside it, bacteria and archaeobacteria, the DNA molecule exists as a, as a circular piece of DNA. But in order to get all that DNA into the cell, the cell has to supercoil the DNA in order to get it compact enough to fit inside the cell. 
Um, if you, you're, you, everybody here is familiar with supercoiling, and it probably drives you nuts. Uh, have you ever, you, a telephone cord is a helix, right? And if you pick up the phone and you start talking to somebody and you twist the receiver, what you've done by twisting the receiver is you've introduced torsional strain into the telephone cord. So when you hang up the phone, the telephone cord goes, <laughs> right? And you can never get it, you never can get it straightened out ever again. It's because there's torsional strain, and in order to distribute that torsional strain along the whole cord, it supercoils. Well, this is exactly what happens inside the cell. There's a collection of enzymes called topoisomerases that essentially introduce torsional strain into the DNA double helix, and it supercoils. Well, before replication can occur, the cell has to undo that mess, so to speak, and so there's an enzyme called a DNA gyrase that binds to the DNA and relaxes the supercoiling to allow DNA replication to occur. And then... Um, <clears throat> There's an en another enzyme called a helicase. It's a molecular motor that begins to unwind the DNA molecule. Now, the single strands of DNA are actually chemically fragile and will break quite readily, so there's a bunch of proteins that bind to the single strands of DNA. These are called single-stranded binding proteins that protect the DNA. Uh, before replication can occur, uh, you have to lay down what's called an RNA primer. You can't just simply start DNA replication from DNA immediately from DNA, the cell lays down a little RNA primer. There's a huge uh, bio machine called a, a primosome that lays down that RNA primer. Then there's a whole collection of enzymes called DNA polymerases that actually synthesize the DNA. And then um, once that, that synthesis takes place, there are enzymes called exonucleases that get, a ri get rid of all the messenger RNA, or the, or the RNAs. In fact, every one of the discontinuous fragments has messenger RNAs or, or RNA molecules, RNA primers laid down before that short strand can be uh, synthesized. So you have to get rid of all that, uh, that RNA, and exonucleases do that. Then there's other enzymes, other DNA polymerases that come in and fill in those gaps. There's enzymes called ligases that connect everything and ligate everything or join everything together. And then there are proofreading enzymes that come along and check the replication job to make sure no errors have taken place. If an error occurs, the DNA double helix will be distorted and the machinery can recognize that, cut out the defective, uh, uh, P, uh, the defective region of the DNA molecule and replace it with the appropriate sequence. This process arose independently two separate times in archaeobacteria and eubacteria. What I presented here is essentially an overview of DNA replication. It's far more complicated than this. And if <clears throat> I mean, if, you're, if, if there's anybody out there that's a biochemist, you know what I'm talking about because you, you've taken exams on this. But the point is that if you're an evolutionist, this is, this is the conclusion that you have to accept as part of the evolutionary paradigm. Does this conclusion make sense? Well, this is what Bill Schaff says. Bill Schaff is a well-known origin of life researcher. In his book, Life's Origins, he says, because biochemical systems comprise many intricately interlinked pieces, any particular full-blown system can only arise once. Since any complete biochemical system is far too elaborate to have evolved more than once in the history of life, it is safe to assume that microbes of the primal last common ancestor cell line had the same traits that characterize all its present day descendants. What Bill Schaff is saying is that this is the reasonable prediction you'd make from an evolutionary framework and what is being discovered is that this prediction is being violated to, uh, in, in a big way with respect to DNA replication. Okay, this is an obvious problem. This is why I say this is one of the most significant problems in my mind for the theory of evolution and the fact that evolution occurred. Now this also I think is a marker for intelligent design. Uh, I worked for seven years in, in product development and, and I worked for a company that's well known around the world for its R&D and about four or five years into my position the vice president of research and development issued an edict in which he said, everybody stop inventing new things. Start using stuff that we've already invented. In fact, you actually got, when you, did, you had your yearly performance evaluation, they actually created a new category called search and reapply, where you would actually get more credit if you used something else that somebody else invented than if you invented something new. Because that's an elegant way to, to invent. 
is to use good designs over and over again. Uh, that's a rational way to efficiently event and, and create. And I would argue that this repeated origin of these complex systems, time and time again, that we're discovering is it, at, at the molecular level all the way through the organismal level is a marker for the work of an intelligent designer. And uh, so basically what I've said today is that uh, repeated evolution and convergence represent a significant challenge to the fact that evolution occurred, and I think it provides evidence for intelligent design. I would even argue it reflects the work of a single designer, but that's another topic for another time. Uh, but I think this also represents a very important uh, opportunity for the intelligent design research program, because all I've done today is simply presented a literature review. Uh, and there's a lot of work that, that somebody could do in this area in terms of uh, really advancing understanding and insight. This is a, a prime area for the ID movement to focus on. And so I'm just going to stop uh, my presentation by just asking the question, uh, is evolution a fact uh, light, in light of new discoveries? So thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Can you identify ways in which ID would specifically be able to provide insight in terms of making predictions about what you should expect to find with respect to some of these examples? Um, that's a good question. I've, I've not thought about that uh, to the, the degree that I think you're asking, but I think an obvious prediction is that the more that we characterize origins, we're going to see more and more and more and more examples. So I think that would be an, an obvious, very armchair prediction that's very easy to make. Uh, but, but I think um, uh, what it would, what it, I think um, one thing that it, it should do is if you're looking at things from an ID perspective, is that when you do see complex systems, I think you're not going to immediately assume that the origin of those systems was a one-time event but that rather that you're going to be open to the idea that this could have emerged independently and begin to probe that immediately or that's going to be part of what you're going to be testing for. But um, um, that's a good question. I've not thought about it that much yet. Like, like I say, this is still in my mind very much an idea in its, in its you know, genesis, if you will. And, and I'm not smart enough to do this work. I'm looking for these young, young guys. I'm an old guy now, but you're looking for these young guys to come up with ideas um, along this line and actually do a, a real research project. Uh, you presented the idea that um, the replication was uh, diphyletic uh, for bac U bacteria and archaea, but you didn't give any uh, evidence for the fact that it's diphyletic. You just said that it was. What is the evidence that that this process has right. is in uh, fact it's, different. It's based on work done by uh, a scientist named Eugene Koonin, who's at NIH. And he wrote a paper uh, that was published in 1999, and I believe it was published in Nucleic Acids Research. But I'm not positive on that. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. But That's right. That's right. Right. But, but following up on this point, uh, it's, I had the same question in a sense. Uh, can you explain how uh, the archaea and the bacteria could ex even exist without the polymerase? Because, I mean, to replicate, they need these polymerases. So how can you say that they first existed for a while and then uh, developed independently these, uh, these polymerases? Well, I mean, that's, that's a very perceptive question. And, and that really gets rolled into the origin of life question, in essence. But, but, but what... What I think the way Eugene Koonin would conceive it and the way original life researchers would conceive it is that there was this primitive biochemistry uh, that was based on an RNA world type of scenario that, was in, that invented contemporary biochemistry ba based on proteins and DNA molecules and that the, the last universal common ancestor would have largely been an RNA metabolic system that independently invented... <laughs> The, the protein world in the, in the DNA world, or, or, or that process of inventing it independently led to, right, so that, that's how the evolutionists would. So, do. no, I, I agree with that point, but uh, 
I, I, I think you cannot at the same time make the statement that you, know, you have two independent uh, developments of the polymerases. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I track your, your, I'm not sure I'm tracking with you, sorry. Uh, that's very simple. So even ha if, you have, if you have a replicating system, you need some kind of polymerases. Okay. So to either, if you would have a common ancestor from the RK and the, and the uh, bacteria, you need a polymerase to replicate those systems. So you, you, you right. cannot find, first have a system which doesn't have polymerases right. at all, and then only later have convergent well, uh, now, development. What you're of saying, and, and, and I would agree with this, that when you have a DNA world that, that in which the function is carried out by proteins, when you have the DNA protein world that emerges, I agree with you that those systems all have to be present simultaneously for it to work. I agree with that point. But what I, the way I'm answering the question is, how does an evolutionist conceive that this is possible, and they, they argue that it's, the, the way they get around this is by appealing to an RNA world where the RNA is both the information storage molecule and the catalytic molecule as well, and that that RNA world invented the DNA protein world. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm saying that's how the evolutionists, you know, try to, to that's how they accommodate this result. I, w I wanted to say, I want to come back to the first question about the prediction. Isn't it the case that, in a sense, the prediction is that you would find multiple s systems that perform the same function in disparate lines of descent. That's, that's a prediction of design, that right. you would find that, and it's something that's contrary to the empirical expectations of Darwinism. Right, exactly. So in, in yeah. a sense, I don't know what else there is to ask for in the realm of prediction. The prediction is, is there, which leads to a second point, which I think that a lot has been made about the importance of prediction for validating the bona fides of a scientific theory. But I think it's important to realize that explanatory power is also one of the key features of a good theory. And there's an increasing literature in the history and philosophy of science showing that whether a theory provides predictions before the fact or explanations of already known facts after the fact really doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, general relativity, for instance, was well established well before the famous light bending experiment uh, on the basis of observations that were, had already been made that general relativity could explain better than its, its uh, pre previous theories of gravity. So I think as we're thinking about the design, uh, intelligent design as a scientific research program, we should also be touting its explanatory power as one of the key features and not only placing on ourselves a burden for making new predictions of new data that we don't yet have uh, and realizing that one of the reasons that there's so much interest in intelligent design is that it explains so much that we already know about and it explains it better than the leading uh, uh, competitor hi uh, evolutionary hypotheses. Okay. <clears throat> Can we pass the mic down? I have a follow-on then to that, and in terms of explanatory power, I enjoyed the, the runnid frogs example and how in India and Madagascar they are morphologically the same, or seemingly, and, uh, and it's hard, I understand how it's hard for the evolutionist to explain that. What, what is the explanation from a design point for why two things that look the same would have different guts, so to speak? Well, I mean, the explanation would be that those were good designs for that particular environment and that the designer chose to reutilize those good designs. Why, why the difference at all? Why not just make them the same? I don't know. <laughs> One, one more question here, then we'll take a 10-minute break before the next uh, talk. Uh, I was talking with a, a, a colleague, friend of mine, about, about topoisomerases. And um, he was a, an evolutionary biologist. And um, one of the things about topoisomerases that I was, I was uh, commenting on them, I was saying that these, these things uh, are very complex, these topoisomerase enzymes. And uh, they, they looked like they were uh, highly specified. And I didn't think that they were capable of being evolved. And he said that, well, uh, maybe, perhaps, uh, there were uh, primitive living organisms that had small chromosomes that didn't suffer from the problem of supercoiling. Therefore, you didn't need topoisomerase. Uh, is, do you know if that's the case? 
Uh, I don't know what the distribution of topoisomerases is in nature, but um, I, I just don't know the, 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 the answer to that question specifically. I just don't know how they're distributed necessarily. But um, in, in, a, in a sense, though, that, that the response that your friend gave you was really a just-so story. You know, and, you know, there is some work that's going on right now in terms of defining minimum, comple minimum complexity of life that might be uh, pertinent in terms of addressing that question. But yeah, but I don't know. Sorry. Okay, let's thank Mr. Uh, Dr. Anna again. <laughs> <laughs>